All right, hello. Welcome to a lesson on set theory. This is going to be lesson 14. 14 if you're in Algebra 2. And in Algebra 1.5, it's going to be more like 20 or 21. I'm actually going to do a geometry review or preview in Algebra 1.5 that I'm going to hope won't be as necessary in Algebra 2 because all the people in Algebra 2 are either also in Geometry or had it the previous year, whereas only part of the people in Algebra 1.5 I can say that about Geometry. So we're going to be looking at a lot of vocabulary and just a little bit of sort of uh, things that you actually would sort of work on or whatever. So this is a very vocabulary intensive lesson. Please pause and go back over these definitions as you have to. Um, I'll start with a little historical background because honestly this is one of the newest things that I will teach you all year. Um, this works roughly a hundred years old, 100, 125 years ago. Um, the person who gets credit for creating it actually died in the 1900s. He saw uh, World War One. in fact. In fact, World War One was one of the many sort of sad or tragic things about his life. Um, in the modern world, we would probably have identified this guy as having some sort of uh, chronic depression and get, gotten him some help and some medication that would have probably helped him a lot. Um, so he's probably had an underlying health condition, but the last decade or two of his life, he had a lot of uh, mental breakdowns, for lack of a better way of putting it. He actually died in a sanitarium. Granted, it was kind of a cushy, rich, I need a break style, more so than like the insane asylum, but still... Uh, he had some really uh, serious troubles. And they were aggravated by um, public attacks on his work. He was struggling to work with problems mathematically that are now known to be impossible. And uh, during the tail end of his life, practically everything he really had was destroyed by World War I. Um, the public attacks on his work, it's kind of an interesting story in my opinion, someone that he thought was his friend and mentor, someone that had helped him uh, become a mathematician, be get a doctorate, uh, get a job potentially at a university, those sorts of things. Um, once he started working independently, that person pub publicly criticized his work and said that it was didn't have value or was worthless or was completely wrong. So those would kind of be troubling things. Um, parts of his work are now known to be impossible. With all that taken together, though, since his death, it's um, the last hundred years or so of mathematics, they've gone back and reworked a lot of mathematics to include his idea of sets and his ideas of infinity, because it turned out they were really good ideas. Um, it just took a little while to recognize that. It wasn't uh, immediately recognized during his lifetime. A set is sort of a, an undefined term in mathematics, but we're going to agree that it means a list, group, or collection of objects that are being thought of sort of as one thing. And those one those individual things are called elements. And so by, by example, we can say that the set A is going to include 1, 2, and 3. We always are going to use capital letters to name our sets, and we're always going to start and stop or enclose our sets in braces. These are called braces. Um, one is a set with well, one is a part of set A, four is not. And so you can use this symbol to mean is an element of or is part of. And so you're probably not terribly shocked that when you put a slash through it, it means not. So one is an element of A, four is not an element of A. In real life, you use sets to refer to collections as a whole when you talk about encyclopedias, or golf clubs, or Pokemon cards, 
or it's even hitting, hidden in the word place setting, which generally refers to some combination of these sorts of things, which you think of them all together. You've already worked with sets a lot in math. Um, you just didn't necessarily think of it as sets because the solutions of an inequality or an equation or points on a line or uh, you might have actually specifically heard it referred to as a set of data points or the possibilities in a probability experiment like heads or tails for flipping a coin or the numbers in a pattern or sequence. All those things are now thought of in terms of sets. They are individual things that in some circumstances are easier to think of as sort of more of the parts of a whole. One of the easiest ways to think about sets is Venn diagrams. So you've been doing Venn diagrams since probably third, fourth, fifth grade. So everything you've ever done with Venn diagrams was actually about sets. And you're probably not terribly shocked why is it called a Venn diagram. It actually comes from um, someone's name, it was his last name. They are actually a little bit older than set theory. 1881 was when that was um, book was published that would include set diagrams. Notice that that would have been well within Cantor's lifetime. So he would have probably been familiar with John Venn's work. Um, A little bit more vocabulary, and I don't think you have to write these down. It's more I just want you to have heard the phrase, well-defined, a set's well-defined if you can decide whether or not a given element is an element of that set. And The idea is that sets need to be described precisely and accurately, or just list everything that's in there. So here's an example of not well-defined. Um, set of Mr. Carpenter's students who like his class. Um, that's not a very well-defined set because liking someone's class sort of means different things to different people. And so that, that set could be probably better defined than that. Hopefully it's a set that would have a few of you in it, but I'm not 100% sure which because that's not going to mean the same thing to everyone. And the ellipsis, a lot of you call that dot, dot, dot. It actually has a name, ellipsis. Press your English teachers later today by referring to it as an ellipsis. Um, sometimes we use those when we're making lists, even within sets. But you just have to be careful how you use that, which we'll see that in a moment. Uh, the next thing on the notes page is really about roster form. And so here are the four examples worked out for you. So we're just going to kind of talk about each one. The set V of vowels in the English alphabet, well, it tells you to name the set V. V equals, it's a set, so we're going to start it with braces or enclose it in braces. Vowels in the English alphabet would include the letters A, E, I, O, U. Some of you might ask, what about Y? Well, remember the familiar saying, sometimes Y. So in order for this to be well defined, we have to leave out Y, because Y is sometimes a vowel, but it's not always a vowel. The set C of primary colors, uh, C is equal to the set that includes blue, red, yellow. For paint or pigment, that is your primary colors. The set A of letters in the English alphabet, A equals, start the set. Give me at least a few letters to get me going. Use the ellipsis. Give me a few to let me know that you're stopping. You do not have to list out all 26 letters. In fact, in the next example, that would be impossible. Set N of counting numbers. N equals, start the set, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on. Notice that we're using the ellipsis a very different way here than we are here. In set A, we're using the ellipsis to leave out some of the middle that we uh, feel that the reader should be able to fill in. Here, we're using the ellipsis to show that it just keeps going forever. The null set or empty set, I actually prefer the phrase empty set. I feel like it's more descriptive, although null is a good word. It does mean nothing or none. It contains no elements. Um, I prefer this symbol for empty set. A lot of you have used that in the past in other ways in mathematics. Please only use it as empty set. 
I've seen people use it for like no solution and that's not I understand that usage but it's not 100% correct that is actually the Greek letter Phi the universal set well this might make you think of the universe is the set that contains all possibilities within a situation or context and we're going to use a capital U for universal set so we'll never name a set U unless it's a universal set um, that would be bad manners to call some set U just because you're talking about unicorns or something else that might start with U we're going to agree that we always use U for universal sets finite if it has exactly n things in it where, where n's zero or a number you can count to so the idea of finite is it's definite certain specific um, on the previous example here all of these were finite except for the last one this one has five elements this one is three this one is 26 this one however is infinite it has infinitely many things in it so that's our other option is an infinite set uh, the null sets finite because you can count how many things are in it zero depending on the context the universal set might be finite it might be infinite it just depends on what you're doing um, this is kind of a tricky word in mathematics. Equivalent. Two sets are equivalent. The prefix EQUI should make you think of equal, but it's not the exact same as equal. Um, two sets are equivalent if they can be placed to a one to one correspondence, meaning you can pair one thing from this set with exactly one thing from this other set over here. They have the same number of elements, basically. Two sets are equal if they have the same elements, and they don't have to be listed in the same order. Um, sort of a tricky example of this would be if you did the letters A, B, C, D capitalized like here, but then you did another set where it was A, B, C, D and it was lowercase. Technically, as far as a mathematician is concerned, those are only equivalent because the difference between capital and lowercase might actually mean something. So we don't want to assume that they are actually the same. This is the part that sort of gives people trouble. It's called set builder notation and it has this basic format. Set S is equal to the set of all things X. You read this vertical line as such, that, or where, and then you put some sort of property or description over here. Um, and so the examples I give you on the notes are, you know, you get E is 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, and so on. Well, most of you can figure out that a good description for the things in that set are even natural numbers. And so we would write in set builder notation, E is equal to the set of all elements of X, such that X is an even natural number. Um, a slightly different way of writing the same thing that I do want you to see is you could say, oh, let's switch from ballpoint. All right. You can say the set E is the set of all elements X, where X is an element of our natural number set. Um, such that, you know, X is even. That's a slightly different way. I think I mentioned this back in a lesson on numbers. That's what we talked about, the idea that that's a standard symbol for natural numbers. So more specifically, the set of natural numbers. Whereas Z is integers. That came from the German word for number. Uh, Q was rational from quotient. And then real numbers was an or the set of real numbers is a kind of a capital R. Some people call this uh, font blackboard bold because if you want to write in bold on a blackboard, you can't really do that. So you use these extra lines. So some books would have these symbols just in bold. 
The other example with set builder notation was P equals Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. Um, most of you, of course, read through that and you pretty quickly figure out, well, that's just sort of a list of the planets. we got to be a little more specific. Uh, so in set builder notation, I wrote P equals the set of all X such that X is a planet orbiting the star Sol because that's uh, one of the technical names for our sun, or X is a planet orbiting our sun. Um, five to ten years ago, if I were teaching this, I wouldn't have had to been as particular here because at the time we didn't know of any planets elsewhere. We've since, uh, scientists have taken care of that for us, though. We now know of dozens, if not hundreds, of what's called extrasolar, I believe, planets, planets that are outside of our solar system. And we've also, in the last five to ten years, kicked Pluto out of this list because we've also just found all these basically dirty ice balls out there sort of in the same region as Pluto. And so you kind of either have to um, kick out Pluto or throw in a bunch of things that we really don't want to throw in as planets. All right. On these, I really want to point out to you the Venn diagrams are going to be extremely helpful. And then I also put something up here in symbols that um, those of you that go on to see this sort of more at the college level, you'll see this again. But the Venn diagram is probably what's going to help you understand it right now. So the idea of a subset, well, sub means like under or beneath. So this is like a set under or beneath another set. Well, what's that mean? It means that one set is inside of the other so you would say A is a subset of B, or you could say, if you're more focused on B, you could say that set B contains set A. Some sort of fun with subsets. This is where you start getting into, like, kind of seeing maybe why uh, Cantor's ideas were a little bit crazy at the time. First, one's not too terribly shocking. Any set's a subset of the appropriate universal set. Fine, I get that. The empty set or null set is a subset of any set. In English, what you would say is that everything contains nothing. Everything contains, the second bullet is saying everything contains nothing, which sounds a little funny at first. Um, any set is a subset of itself. So it's sort of in English or in everyday words, you would say that everything contains itself, which, again, might sound a little funny at first. It gets even worse when you start thinking about, well, what happens if you take, this is, you know, known to be the empty set. Well, what happens if you put that inside of a set? Well, this is not empty. So please don't ever oopsie and do that because that's technically not empty. That outermost set has one thing in it. My standard analogy for this is, um, you know, pretend this is a bag. Well, the bag can be empty. Pretend this is a trash can. The trash can can be empty. But as soon as you place the bag in the trash can, the bag's still empty, but what about the trash can? Well, the trash can's no longer empty. It's got one thing in it. And so that's kind of what's going on here. Um, Either of these two symbols mean something empty, but if you accidentally put one inside the other, it's not anymore. The bag's empty, the trash can's empty, but a bag inside of a trash can, well, the bag's still empty, but not the trash can anymore. And some students find that kind of humorous, and some students think that that's me just being ridiculous. Uh, complement of a set. 
and by the way, disjoint does come up in a minute. The complement of a set, I'm going to choose to use this prime notation, although I've also seen overlining and little superscripts of C. This is one of the few things where there are three or four different symbols running around, and they've never come to an agreement about which one should be used. The complement of a set includes everything else, and so if this is some set and this is the universal set, then all the stuff over in here is the complement. It's kind of like uh, what's the it's kind of like opposite of, so to speak. If you're looking at all the students in the class, what's the opposite of the boys? The girls. And so the idea is that the complement of a set is the set of all x that are possible but not already included in a set. And so not too shockingly, what's the opposite of nothing? Everything. The complement of the null set is the universal set. What's the opposite of everything? Nothing. So the complement of the universal set is the null set. Oh, by the way, please don't just try to write down the definition, but also do either your own version of this Venn diagram or copy it because I'll tell you, I promise you, the Venn diagrams are probably what most of you are going to think of when you're trying to do answer questions about this. What about a set difference? It's supposed to make you think sort of like subtraction. You take set A, you cut off the part of set B, uh, you cut off the part of set A that's also in set B and throw it away. Then what you're left with is sort of like Pac-Man shape right here is the set difference. And so you would say that A minus B is a set that includes any element of set A that is not also an element of set B. And so it, in, in set builder notation it looks like this. A minus B is a set of all elements of X such that X is in A but not in B. And sort of my open question I would ask you here is how does the Venn diagram change if we do a different subtraction B minus A? I think most of you could pretty quickly tell me what would happen there. If not, think about it. Intersection might make you think of like a road where two roads cross or overlap. And so uh, it's kind of more like what people are used to with Venn diagrams is here's two things, shade the intersection. It includes any element that's a set of both set A and set B, any element that's a part of both set A and part B. So our symbol for intersection is going to be kind of this upside down U, or I tell some people to think of it as like the kind of like the N, but not exactly. N as in intersection, kind of like intersection here. And so it would be set of all elements X such that X is an element of A and X is an element of B. Excuse me kids stuff in the way. So disjoint sets have no elements in common. So my question for you here would be, what's a Venn diagram look like for disjoint sets? How can we draw this? Here's set A. And dooby dooby doo, you think about it for a second, and maybe you realize that you could sort of make it look like a brick. This is disjoint sets. Disjoint. Join as in together, dis as in not, not together. Sets that have no elements in common, they don't overlap at all. Well, union. Well, the union kind of tells you why we use that upside down U, because we're going to use U for union. Um, includes any element in, from either set A or set B. You join the two sets together. So A union B is a set of all elements X, such that X is an element of A. Now the keyword's or, X is an element of B. So for intersection, we're looking at the word and and the overlap. For union, we're looking at the word or and it's all together. I got everybody else in bed. Uh, I got to finish this example for you all. First thing, um, at least when you're first getting used to these sorts of problems where you're actually trying to use this stuff, is to realize that we're just looking at you know a list here with some numbers. And so we might go ahead and make a Venn diagram just to kind of help us out. I'm try to see if I can uh, get one sketched right in sort of this area. Um, we're going to use the box to be the universal set. 
And so I'm going to use a circle or an oval or just any sort of amorphous blob. It doesn't really matter what it looks like to represent set A here. So um, an A is going to have two, three, five. So there's set A. B needs to have two and four, and the two's already right here. So that's B. And let's see, two, three, four, five. The only thing that's left out of the list that's an option is one. And so one can just sit or be floating over here by itself, just hanging out. And then we're going to use that picture to help us work out each of these problems. So when you look at this Venn diagram or you look at these sets, what are the things not an A? What's A complement? And hopefully you can convince yourself that the things that are not an A are 1 and 4. The set containing 1 and 4. B complement um, 3, 5, and 1. And we agree to generally write things in order, not that it matters. Okay, so which one is this? Uh, this is intersect. And if you look at the picture, the only thing they have in common, the overlap, is just two. And then this one's union because it looks like the U. And again, that's kind of the idea of um, a union is uh, two things coming together and becoming like one thing, like marriage is a legal, legal union. Or during the Civil War, the Union referred to the states that wanted to preserve the United States and keep it all together. And just like when you get married, if you if you have two toasters, it doesn't really matter. You, you just get rid of a toaster and you say, well, we have a toaster. And so we're going to take sets A and B, we're going to put them together, and it doesn't matter that they have a two in common. All we need is one copy of everything they have. Well, everything they have would be the 2, a 4, a 3, a 5. So 2, 3, 4, 5. If you look at sort of this region of the Venn diagram, just imagine that becoming one big circle. You would have 2, 3, 4, 5. A minus B is you look at A and then you're going to cut off the 2 and throw it away. So A minus B is 3 and 5. B minus A, on the other hand, if you do the subtraction in the other order, well, you start with B, 4 and 2, but you would cut 2 off and throw it away. So B minus A is just 4. And uh, I have a worksheet that we'll probably end up doing in class within your groups where you just got a bunch of these problems and, and they're mostly either true or false or just fairly straightforward um, try to come up with little, an little answer type questions um, so that we can get some extra practice with this since this is completely new to almost everybody but don't underestimate the importance of just getting down like what these symbols mean if you can read the notation and understand what it means um, you'll find that it's fairly straightforward and easy for most of the things that I'll actually ask you to do. Thank you and uh, see you next time.